Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Jane Grenville. I'm currently the chair of the trustees of the Council for British Archaeology. Um, and it gives me very great pleasure in that capacity to welcome you this afternoon. Um, we've decided we've got, we've got quite a, a big slate for the AGM today. Um, and we've decided to begin um, by inviting interested speakers to come and talk to us about their vision for Stonehenge and for the Stonehenge landscape. Um, we wanted to do this because the CBA promulgated some principles for Stonehenge in 1998 uh, in advance of various schemes, some of which you will see have, have come to pass, so that we had a set of principles against which we could evaluate schemes. We are proposing to update those principles in the light of the changes that have occurred, and this uh, debate this afternoon is part of that process. I'm not going to go through what those principles are. It would be tedious, they are on the website. What I wanted to do uh, was just to begin with some orientation slides, uh, and then I'm going to invite speakers to come. I have asked them uh, to be six minutes. Uh, that's going to be quite a test. They're not going to be six minutes, but if they're more than about eight or nine minutes, uh, I have a small pistol and it is loaded with live ammunition. <laughs> Um, so, I, if, if, uh, if people will then come up uh, and speak, uh, and we've asked uh, Historic England to speak, uh, we've asked the National Trust, we've asked the Stonehenge Alliance, ICOMOS, and the English Heritage Trust in that order, but I will introduce people as they come up. I just wanted to do a quick orientation, an overview of the Stonehenge part of the World Heritage Site and its landscape. For those of you who may not ever have been, and Interestingly, there are people who have never been to Stonehenge, uh, and for those who went so long ago that it is but a hazy memory. So here is a site map uh, which shows you the boundaries of the Stonehenge section of the World Heritage Site and the proliferation of sites, both large and small, within that landscape. Um, the, the pink ones are scheduled ancient monuments, uh, the blue ones are conservation areas, the green one is a registered park and garden, uh, the whole of that sort of yellowy area uh, is under an Article 4 direction. So there is a lot of, uh, of designation on the site. Um, and a second map that I put up which shows roughly uh, the same thing is to emphasise uh, the roads, um, which you can see running through the middle of the site, uh, and uh, the visitor facilities, the location of the old and the new visitor facilities. I wonder if I have a pointer. Uh, the stones are here. Can you see the pointer? Yes, the old visitor facilities there, the new visitor facilities at Airman's Corner, uh, away to the west. They're quite flat, these maps, aren't they? Uh, I have to say, I have been uh, shamelessly plagiarising stuff off the web for this, um, and this is Vince Gaffney's LIDAR map, uh, which I'm not going to go into in huge detail, but it does emphasise the undulating nature of the landscape, uh, and it does beautifully illustrate... Uh, I'm going to have to go back one up, there we go. Um, it does beautifully illustrate the way in which the barrow groups inhabit uh, the ridges there uh, and the way in which they cluster uh, around the stones and clearly visible. Um, I have uh, next a distant shot um, which Mike Pitts took the other day. I was standing behind him while he took it, uh, and I've nicked it off his blog. Is he here yet? I haven't seen him. Uh, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, but it is uh, a shot from the south. Uh, it shows you the stones in the distance. Uh, it shows you the uh, visitors who are strung out in a long line here. Uh, it shows you uh, all of the military in, uh, installations at the Backlark Hill camp. And of course, it shows you the road at the front. Uh, and if you want to think any more about the roads, there's a press association photograph of the roads that says quite a lot. Uh, it is basically a grassland landscape. This is a photograph that Kate sent me, uh, which is taken uh, a little while ago at Airman's Corner. And if we look across on the east side of the site, again, you can see grassland site, uh, Barrow Group in the background, and beyond that, that white gash in the background is Solstice Park. So quite a lot of changes. Uh, there has been uh, the closure of uh, the A344 site. Uh, and with that, the movement of the old visitor facilities, which were on the other side of the A344, this road, and they have been moved away to, to the east, and here is the A303. Um, so those are big major changes in which uh, some progress has been made. 
Uh, and, uh, and some changes have occurred that might uh, require us to rethink about what our principles uh, are, whether they are still useful. Uh, and the other major change, uh, that's the uh, new visitor centre at uh, Airman's Corner. The other major change is uh, grassland restoration. Uh, what you see here from the management plan, from the World Heritage Site Management Plan, in green is the extent uh, of grassland, and in the sort of salmon pink, that is arable. Um, but if we look at that again, the dark green uh, is grassland that has been reverted since 2000. So you can see that there's been a, a lot there. There has been stalemate after stalemate at Stonehenge with regard to traffic management, and the removal of the A344 is a notable win. A new outlined scheme for the A303 is now on the table with a board tunnel at least 2.9 kilometres long, at least, not 2.9, but at least, so that will be a minimum. As chair of the trustees of the CBA, I must stress that we have not yet developed a position in response to this, and nor will we until the principles have been updated to take account of the developments that I've just shown you over nearly two decades. What we're here to explore is why it is so very difficult to come to a consensus view. Um, I've talked about the format. Uh, I'm going to invite the speakers uh, to come up one by one and then take their place on the podium. Uh, I'm hoping that we can come to a close as soon after half past three as possible so that we can uh, make a, a, an orderly handover to the AGM. Uh, and I have encouraged in email exchanges the panel members not to try to convert one another to their positions. What we want is a nice clear exposition of, of positions, um, but on the grounds that we haven't got a scheme to dissect, uh, we've got no concrete plans to dissect, this is an opportunity uh, for the discussion of broad principle and high level issues. And particularly, it is an opportunity for you as CBA members uh, to understand the complexities of the situation and to ask questions of clarification uh, to, to those who are going to speak uh, so that you get a really clear idea of what the, the various positions are. My slides have shown you some of the headline visible changes and there are three areas of interest uh, where there have been uh, big changes or there remain big issues. The archaeology, the policy context and the day-to-day -day management of the landscape and in that I include visitor experience, increasing concerns about traffic, natural environment, agricultural regimes, a whole gamut of management issues. I imagine that everybody in the room thinks that we should seek to secure ways to, uh, to secure the future of Stonehenge, but again and again we find that archaeology, policy and management do bump up against one another, even while they are all trying to seek the best solutions. So uh, I want to just begin uh, with this uh, Land Ranger map uh, that shows you again that central core area and what an incredibly busy landscape it is. I really don't want to preempt what Mike Parker Pearson is going to say later. I simply want to say that over the past couple of decades, 15 years maybe, uh, there has been a plethora of new research uh, into the Stonehenge landscape. Mike Stonehenge Riverside Project and his work at Priscelli on the Blue Stones, uh, uh, Jeff Wainwright and Tim Darville's work on the Blue Stone, uh, on the uh, ancient communities and environment in Priscelli. Uh, and that involved an excavation at Stonehenge. Uh, the work that David Jakes has been doing at Blickmead, which has provided such important mesolithic material. The Hidden Landscapes project that Vince Gaffney has been doing. Tim Darville's done geophysics to the north. English Heritage has done earthwork survey all over. There's been a complete laser survey of the stones. There's a huge amount. Thank you. You can see that. Uh, and as I say, that is for Mike. At policy level, We've had the introduction of the National Policy Planning, uh, National Panic Planning Policy Framework in 2012, and that was received with trepidation in the archaeological community as a potential loosener of the controls that protect archaeology. But in terms of World Heritage Sites, it retains most of the earlier advice in the area and it is explicit in setting out policy requirements at a local level. And it's quite strong. And again, I think I'm not going to go through blow by blow, but it, there are tensions even within that advice. How do you protect the World Heritage Site and its setting from inappropriate development? And then as a local councillor, make sure that you are striking a balance between the various values associated with the World Heritage Site and sustainable economic use, because that is seen as one of the values of the World Heritage Site. So immediately we can begin to see tensions. Critically, internationally, there have been changes of emphasis in UNESCO's policy towards World Heritage Sites. 
In terms of international scrutiny of the UK as a state party to the 1972 convention, the most important development has been the requirement introduced in the 2005 operational guidelines for World Heritage Sites for what are known as statements of outstanding universal value. The Stonehenge Avery and Associated Sites statement of outstanding universal value, of course we're archaeologists, I shall shorten this to OUV, was adopted in 2013 and it now constitutes a key policy document for the site. You can find it in the management plan. Any consideration of the site's management and development will have to take into account the contents of the statement of OUV. It makes for a very interesting read. In the section on integrity, the issue of potential extension of the boundaries is raised and the presence of busy main roads is highlighted as problematic. Development pressures are also noted as requiring careful management, and I showed you a Solstice Park slide. Scrutiny of what we do at Stonehenge is not an idle threat, and UNESCO keeps an active watching brief. All of the organisations represented on the panel today were involved in the provision of evidence and information to a joint advisory committee from ICOMOS and UNESCO at the end of last month. It was about, what, 10 days ago, wasn't it? Not long. But it's not only the threat of international scrutiny which should encourage us to take the statement of OUV seriously. If the UK is serious about its commitment under the 1972 Convention to do our utmost, then we should manage the site. There. We should manage the site as well as we can, with or without international scrutiny. And in that respect, we have achieved much in terms of management plans, the latest prepared by Sarah Simmons and Beth Thomas on behalf of the Stonehenge and Avebury World Heritage Steering Committees. Much progress, uh, progress in the plan has been made in the consideration of the whole landscape to which I now turn. I don't want to dwell on the practical complexities of management, and I think some of the others probably will, but just to show you how difficult it is, this map, uh, which again comes from the management plan, shows you the contemporary land ownerships. There is uh, land around Stonehenge that is directly in National Trust ownership and National Trust management, but there is other land around there, particularly to the south, which is in National Trust ownership, but under tenancy and various different sorts of tenancies. The big red block to the top is the military. Uh, the uh, sort of pinkish triangle in the middle is the area that is uh, managed by uh, English Heritage. So it's, it's a very, very complicated uh, uh, management uh, conundrum when you've got so many different interests just on the site, let alone uh, the interests that are uh, of those who are not involved in day-to-day -day management. So what sorts of problems? How do we disperse visitors within this wider landscape to maximise their enjoyment and also to reduce their impact uh, on the site? Are the boundaries of the World Heritage Site in the right place? I, mean, I have to say, they follow roads, actually, and the River Avon uh, and uh, a post-medieval land boundary down at, at the bottom. What are the needs of the wildlife populations, both birds and plants? And what about the local farming community? And what about the military? And then there is the through traffic. Mike and I were joking about this when we were uh, talking about today, about how we'd imagined that by 2015, when we were children, by 2015, we would all be whizzing about in the air with little jetpacks on our backs, wouldn't we? Uh, but alas, no such thing. Uh, the traffic problem is not going away, and indeed there is some evidence that it seems to be worsening. Traffic engineers and politicians are not archaeologists. And what if the voice of the business community were to outweigh ours? How we talk to them is critically important if we're going to get our message across. And the answers are not easy. Every one of the 90-something routes proposed for the A303 over the last quarter century has seemingly had an immovable constraint. Archaeology? Everywhere. Stone curlews to the south. Ammunition dumps to the north. That again. Um, the loss, this one, I'm, I'm, I was, when I first heard it, I was astounded, and then I thought, yeah. The loss of a cherished and familiar landmark on the journey to Cornwall, if you put the road in a tunnel. No, you can't have your sandwiches until we've seen the stones. <laughs> the crux lies in the balance of interest and influence between the archaeology above and below ground and the visitor experience of it, 
the policy platform with regard to outstanding universal value and the broader economic arguments. I'm now going to invite my panel members to give their six to slightly more than six minutes worth. Um, and uh, both uh, Ingrid and Kate have kindly, Kate furnished me with several of these slides uh, and uh, Ingrid and the National Trust uh, with several of them, the rest of them I have nicked. Um, but uh, Kate and Ingrid both have additional images which we'll put up when they ask for them. Um, and I'm now going to ask Andrew Vines, where are we, from English Heritage to come up, uh, from, get it right, Jane, Historic England, to uh, come and speak to us. Thank you all, actually, for the opportunity to come and uh, to debate this issue. Uh, what I briefly want to cover is who we are, Historic England, uh, just cover the governance of the World Heritage Site in general and also the management plan which, which Jane has mentioned and then just talk briefly about how we've got to where we are specifically on the road proposals. Um, so Historic England, we are the government's lead advisor uh, and an advisor to others on uh, heritage and we provide statutory advice to government and to others and we specifically advise government on World Heritage Sites and World Heritage Site policy. Uh, you'll hear from the EH Trust, you will know that we uh, split earlier this year from uh, English Heritage, who took the name as the charity looking after the properties. Uh, okay, right, the World Heritage Site, um, essentially it's a, a partnership of uh, the main uh, bodies with interests in, in Stonehenge and Avery, uh, of which we are one, but it also includes the National Trust, uh, the English Heritage Trust, uh, Natural England, very important, uh, interests such as the MOD, and of course uh, local authorities as well, and the local councils. Uh, there is, a, in structural terms, there's an overarching what's called a partnership panel, uh, which represents the main stakeholders uh, and is also there to deal with the strategic direction, if you like, of the implementation of policy. Under that, there are two World Heritage Sites steering committees, one for Avery and one for uh, Stonehenge, uh, and they deal with the implementation of the, of the management plan at local level. Uh, very important is the coordination unit. Uh, it's hosted by Wiltshire Council. It contains two uh, full-time members of staff, uh, and it's also supported by the National Trust. It's paid for uh, partly by us, partly by Wiltshire Council. So, uh, the management plan. Here's the abridged version. Uh, I'd recommend that as a first read if you don't want to read the whole thing uh, straight away. Uh, it's the first joint management plan. There have been two previous iterations, but this is the first joint one for both parts of the World Heritage Site. Let's not forget Avebury to the north. Um, and it does, as, as Jane outlined, contains the what's called the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value, which defines why it's important in, in World Heritage terms. Um, it contains policies on key management issues, so protection of the sites through the planning system, reversion to grassland has been mentioned, improving the condition of monuments, uh, dealing with burrowing animals, scrub and tree cover, uh, and also research, an archaeological research framework, improving interpretation and education, increasing ecological diversity, and of course reducing the adverse impact of, of roads. So, um, very briefly, the road issue. Uh, you will know, of course, that it's been a long-standing uh, issue in the World Heritage Site, going right back to its inscription in 1986, and actually road proposals in various forms have been there since the 1960s. Uh, in 2004, I'm sure you will remember that the 2.1 the, the kilometre tunnel proposal came to naught. Um, more recently, in 2013, we've had the closure of the A344, which I think was a major step forward. So that's where we were a couple of years ago, but um, in 2014 the government announced that it wanted to upgrade the A303, so the issue of the 303 was back on the table. Uh, the background I think is important, uh, government drive to improve infrastructure, and I think it's worth saying also some of the uh, issues that we had in the South West, particularly the recent flooding and weather events, uh, had shown how vulnerable the Southwest's infrastructure was and how vulnerable the connections are to the rest of the country. So at one point, for example, the strip of tarmac past Stonehenge, not much bigger than this platform, not much wider than the platform, was the only main way in or out of the Southwest region. So when this came back, we've only made one assumption in all this, for which I don't make any apology, and that is that sooner or later, government will do something with or without us. And because of that, uh, I think the, the political messages were clear on that, um, and it led us to two fairly key decisions. We wanted to work closely with the National Trust, unfortunately 
they felt the same way about working with us, uh, which was good. Um, and we felt that we all felt that we needed to get on the front foot and advise government on the best possible solution rather than simply react to something that came forward. And I think if we hadn't done that and if we don't continue to do that, there is that risk that a decision will be imposed um, of which we may not have too much control. So I think that approach was probably borne out by the uh, initial proposals that came forward from the Department for Transport, uh, which showed two uh, alternative surface duelling routes, one to the north and one to the south, both highly damaging. You don't need to see the detail. You can imagine how they impact on the monuments in the World Heritage Site, and also the option of the 2.1 kilometre tunnel. Um, when that came up previously, uh, in, the time, in the intervening time, I think our view about the value of the World Heritage Site has changed. Back in the early 2000s, there was this notion of uh, Stonehenge having a sort of core area in what was known as the Stonehenge Bowl, and that was according greater value than the wider landscape. Clearly, uh, research since then has shown that not to be the case, and the current management plan uh, gives great, equal weight to the wider landscape as it does to Stonehenge itself. So um, that notion of a 2.1 kilometre tunnel raised some alarm with us in terms of the present policy context. Uh, and we had a very short window with the National Trust to undertake some in initial, what we called a preliminary outline assessment. And the purpose of that was to see if there might be an acceptable solution, not to define in any detail what it, might be, what it would be, but to simply uh, see whether there was a, a means by which we could go forward and, and feedback to government. Now, I know Ingrid's going to talk in a bit more detail about how uh, that uh, was dealt with, but it was really that that led directly to the government announcement, uh, as has been said, of a board tunnel of at least 2.9 kilometres last December. So there is no design scheme at the moment. It's simply an announcement that something of this order will be taken forward, and we can talk about how that might be taken forward uh, in due course. I think I'll stop there. So, hello, I'm Ingrid Samuel. Um, I'm Historic Environment Director for the National Trust. And the Trust cares for over 2,000 acres of the Stonehenge landscape, as you saw on the map that was put up earlier. Um, as an owner of that scale, what I wanted to do is really share a broader vision for the World Heritage Site as a whole, first of all, and then turn to the road. The Trust takes landscape seriously. We care for a lot of them. 25% of the Lake District, 15% of Snowdonia, 12% of the Peak District. And these are all very different places, but they do have one thing in common. Each has a character and a significance that derives from both their cultural and natural features and the interplay between them. So human activity shaped by the land in which it sits and shaping that land in turn. And the Stonehenge landscape is no exception, of course. The Trust cares about every aspect of the World Heritage Site, therefore, everything that makes it nationally and indeed internationally important. The Stonehenge landscape is also held by the Trust inalienably, which means we can't sell or give it away. We will care for it forever. But the Trust was not founded just to look after places. At a time of industrialization and urbanization, we were set up to protect places for people. People who couldn't do it for themselves. Fair enough. To ensure that they and we continue to have access to green spaces and our unique heritage. So in Trust speak, forever and for everyone. And so in line with our founding purpose, we see three important sets of values at Stonehenge a wider archaeological landscape of immense significance, a rare chalk grassland habitat, and the opportunity to share this with others. And we've heard already today about the volume of research and how that is transforming our understanding of that landscape. But we have a long-term vision to do a great deal more. Over the past 15 years, the Trust has removed hundreds of acres of land from the plow and returned it to chalk grassland. And we've done this to accomplish two significant goals, protecting archaeology and the setting of archaeological monuments in the World Heritage Site, and to create a haven for wildlife, brown hare, skylark, grey partridge, the Adonis blue butterfly. But there's further to go. So in hence the dark sky area, and we need to improve tranquility, night and day. And there's much further to go in terms of opening up the Stonehenge landscape to people. Today, two thirds of the Stonehenge, of the World Heritage Site is cut off by the A303. 90% of visitors have no sense at all that the World Heritage Site is more than the Stonehenge Monument itself. 
To the north of the A303, we've made some progress, and with the EH Trust, we've opened access to the landscape through our, our land at Fargo Woods. But we can't do this at the south because of the dangerous division of the road. So in World Heritage terms, we are failing to transmit a full understanding of outstanding universal value for which the World Heritage Site was designated. Now, the Trust isn't alone in our ambition to do better. Everything I've spoken about, as we've heard, represents a shared commitment in the 2015 World Heritage Site Management Plan. And we've heard today about progress that's already been made, the relocation of the visitor center, the removal of part of the A344, and its return to grassland. There's a momentum here that we can be proud of and that we can capitalize on. But there is also a huge challenge. A significant blot on the landscape remains in the shape of the A303. And today, the impact of the A303 is not only as bad, as, is not only as, bad as ever, but appears to be getting worse. Surveys have suggested that in a few years' time, the congestion will be as bad midweek, midwinter, as they are today on a summer bank holiday weekend. And we've already mentioned the flooding in 2013. So in September 2014, we reached a crossroads. The government decided it was going to take very seriously the need to do something about the A303. For the National Trust, this presented both a significant risk and an important opportunity. There was a risk that the wrong solution would be adopted. And you heard that we were presented with three of those as possible government approaches, two surface reroutes through the World Heritage Site and the 2.1 kilometer tunnel. And at the same time, we knew there was a significant lobby to just duel the road. But there's an obvious opportunity as well. If a deliverable scheme appropriate to the World Heritage Site could be found. If. And so we thought we needed to understand the if. To inform our thinking with English Heritage, we jointly carried out the preliminary outline assessment that we've heard a little bit about. Um, and that was an assessment of a number of hypothetical alternative options to the government's unacceptable proposals. To do this, we considered potential tunnel locations cited deliberately to take archaeology and topography into account. And then we used ICOMOS's own guidance on heritage impact assessments for cultural world heritage properties to assess the impact on OUV. This was a process of learning and understanding. Now by impact, I mean not just physical, but also we assessed visual and oral impacts. And we didn't look at individual monuments in isolation, we also looked at the integrity and the authenticity of the World Heritage Site as a whole. What we evaluated, what we looked at, was the current A303 as it exists, the 4.5 kilometer uh, tunnel that some groups are calling for, and then a series of, of um, pushpins here shows you some of the other options that we looked at. From C to D, or D to C if you look that way, is the 2.1 kilometer published scheme of 2003. From B, oh gosh, this is backwards, from E to B is a 2.5 kilometer option. From E to A2 is a 2.9 kilometer option online of the current existing road. And from E to A1 is a 2.9 kilometer offline proposal. And I won't say in detail why we chose each one of these individual push pins, but of course we can talk about that later if we'd like to. But I will say the offline proposal was done uh, very deliberately in order to pull any potential portal away from the Winterbone Stoke Barrow Group, which just sits at Winterbone Stoke Roundabout there, to pull the impact away from that very important Barrow Group, and also to take advantage of the natural dip in the land um, further south. What we found, unsurprisingly, is that the current A303 has a major adverse impact on the landscape. 4.5 kilometers, if deliverable, would have a major beneficial impact. But perhaps more surprising, the 2003 2.1 kilometer tunnel would have only a negligible beneficial impact on the World Heritage Site. And then that, that beneficial impact grew and grew as we got through 2.5 and both of the 2.9 kilometer options with 2.9 kilometers offline representing the most beneficial impact on the World Heritage Site. In December 2014, government announced that it intended to upgrade the A303. And crucially, due to the work we did, it also announced a one billion pound mitigation scheme at Stonehenge, a fully bored tunnel of at least 2.9 kilometers. The money is in Highways England's budget. This is a deliverable scheme, but it is at a very early stage. 
Highways England has yet to design it. And precise portal location, design detail, all of that is vital. Going forwards, the DCO process will be very important in providing extensive public consultation, full heritage and environmental impact assessment, and a rigorous examination of any scheme that does come forwards. But the Trust believes that ups upscale engagement, upstream engagement, is also really important. Early influence on siting, on design, and the quality of the scheme as it's being developed is a key way to protect the World Heritage Site. We're particularly grateful to the work of Historic England here, who are currently conducting that research south of the A303, a relatively less explored area of the landscape, in order to help us all better understand archaeological constraints in advance of any design. Now, I can't speak for Highways England, but I can share that they seem to be taking early engagement seriously. And they appear to be relatively sympathetic to avoiding archaeology, to using landform to its best extent and advantage to protect setting and minimize infrastructure impact. And of course, we've sought to engage international advisors, UNESCO and ICOMOS at an earliest stage, as you've heard. So it's in this context of early engagement that we really welcome CBA's constructive approach here today. This is an unusual scheme. It's not simply about introducing major infrastructure into a World Heritage Site. It is about removing existing harm and ensuring significant benefit. And we look forward to ongoing dialogue. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the CBA for inviting us to speak. I'm Kate Fielden, on sec to the Stonehenge Alliance, which is a group of individuals and five national NGOs campaigning in opposition to the proposed short tunnel. We know there's money for a 2.9 kilometre tunnel. We've asked about money for a longer one and we've not had a reply. The primary consideration for us at Stonehenge is heritage protection, not the relief of congestion or stimulation of economic activity. Our online petitions have over 19,000 signatures to date, worldwide. First, I'd like to give you some facts about the A303 at Stonehenge. <clears throat> Last year, the Department for Transport's traffic flow figures were actually lower than in 2002 to 2003, when the earlier tunnel scheme was being brought forward as an exceptional environmental scheme, not primarily on traffic grounds. As in 2004, if tunnelling is undertaken, the present A303 is likely to remain on the surface as a byway for traffic that can't use the tunnel, so you'll still have a road there. In um, 2004, a 2.1-kilometre tunnel was considered by English Heritage the best we can get. Ten years later, we've got a 2.9-kilometre tunnel on the table. Might we do better in years to come? The short tunnel is predicated on what is affordable, deliverable and value for money. The late Lord Kennett, one-time Parliamentary Secretary and our former President, pointed out that in demanding the best for the World Heritage Site, it isn't for us to judge what the Treasury can afford. Should Stonehenge lose its World Heritage status owing to a damaging road scheme, so also would Avebury. Slide two on. I don't know how to put it, I'm afraid. Thank you so much. <laughs> you keep talking. Our approach to planning at Stonehenge is very firmly based on the government's obligations under the World Heritage Convention and the protective planning framework that arises from it now much more robust than in 2004. The principal obligations under the Convention are to protect, conserve and present the whole property and transmit it to future generations. And the government has recently said it will honour these commitments. The importance of the archaeology at Stonehenge needs no endorsement. ICOMOS states that the site's attributes of outstanding universal value, or OUV, must be protected in order to sustain the OUV of the site. Among the site's defined attributes of OUV is the disposition, physical remains and settings of the key Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments and sites, which are together said to form a landscape without parallel. We're increasingly aware of the significance of this landscape, what it tells us about those who designed it, formed and used it. The traces of the past and the collective memory they recall for us and those who follow us would be irrevocably compromised by major road engineering and landscape reconfiguration. William Stukeley deplored the destruction of Stonehenge archaeology by ploughing. Others have campaigned to safeguard its landscape since then. We believe that those who understand what it represents and may yet reveal 
have a particular duty to follow in their footsteps. Our aspirations for the site coincide with the visions of the management plan and the March 2002 press release by 10 conservation organisations, including ourselves and the CBA, who urged search for A303 solutions that avoid impacting on the World Heritage Site, saying also to safeguard the site, the long-term view must always be considered, even for interim or partial solutions. Enhancements might include relocation of the visitor centre and its parking to a less visually intrusive site, taking into account planned relocation of the Artillery Museum to Lark Hill, tree planting and low-level lighting on roundabouts, the screening of Solstice Park Distribution Centre and removal of pylons, measures to reduce rat running through villages, a multimodal transport study for the southwest to look at all transport options and ascertain whether road widening is justified. If road widening and tunnelling are found to be essential, there should be no further damage to the World Heritage Site. In line with planning policy, the setting of the site must also be protected. Finally, we advocate the redesignation of the site as a cultural landscape, possibly to include the Mesolithic. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and I also would like to thank the CBA for giving us all this opportunity to um, present some views on uh, Stonehenge. It's extremely valuable to have this exchange at this particular point. Now, I'm Susan Denyer, and I'm Secretary of ICOMOS UK. And as many of you will know, ICOMOS UK is the UK National Committee of ICOMOS, our parent organisation based in Paris. And it is our parent organisation that is advisor to UNESCO on cultural world heritage sites. ICOMOS UK has no such formal uh, uh, arrangement for commenting on world heritage sites, and I just want to make that clear at the outset. So today I'm here uh, giving you the view from ICOMOS in the UK. Now, since 1988, uh, 1986, when Stonehenge with Avery and associated sites was inscribed on the World Heritage List, and particularly over the past 10 years, there's been growing awareness, as we've heard already this afternoon, of the interrelated nature of the Stonehenge monuments and of the extensive uh, associated underground remains. In terms of World Heritage categories, Stonehenge was inscribed on the World Heritage List as a site, not as a cultural landscape, as Kate has already alluded. Now, why was this? Well, the reasons are very simple. The UNESCO category of cultural landscape was not adopted until 1992, six years after inscription. But that doesn't mean that sites that were inscribed before 1992 were not actually, in effect, cultural landscapes. And Stonehenge was recognised as a, quote, landscape without parallel as has been acknowledged in the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value that was agreed retrospectively by the UNESCO World Heritage Committee in 2013. Now, I just uh, a slight aside on that, I think Jane talked, talk, uh, her phrase was there's been a sort of change of emphasis in, by UNESCO. And I would like to say that I don't think that actually is the case. All sites now have statements of outstanding universal value. All the sites that have been inscribed have had them since 2006, at the moment they were inscribed. These retrospective ones, and it's just worth um, pointing this out, set out retrospectively what was actually agreed at the time of inscription. So they're nothing new. When, a, when the UNESCO World Heritage Committee inscribes a site, it is saying that at the moment of inscription, the committee considers that it has outstanding universal value for the following reasons and satisfies the following criteria. And that is fixed at the moment of inscription. So what these retrospective statements were trying to do, or what they did, was go back to all the original documents and define outstanding universal value that was recognized at the time of inscription. But public perceptions of Stonehenge have nonetheless been very largely coloured by images of the main monument. But there is a general realisation and understanding of the World Heritage Site in the, by the public as a rich archaeological landscape, but this has been slow in developing. Certainly it was not understood in 2004 at the public inquiry that's already been mentioned into the road proposals. And this came sharply into focus in the second or third week of the inquiry, I can't quite remember which, when it became clear that to the inspectors, the word landscape meant grass. 
They thought that a road could be woven around the above ground monuments across what was perceived by them to be empty grass. But surveys and discoveries over the past five years, including the astonishing recent revelations, have now transformed our understanding of this world heritage landscape. And the high profile given to these new discoveries by the media is also rapidly changing public perceptions. What is emerging has strongly reinforced the exceptional nature of the World Heritage Site, not just as an ensemble of above ground structures, but as an extraordinary extensive and intensive multi-layered archaeological landscape with rich spiritual and social associations. I'm really pleased to hear this afternoon that the idea of the Stonehenge bowl is dead once and for all. Now, since 2010, the exemplary management, plan, exemplary management plans have acknowledged this landscape importance, as has the new visitor centre, while the closure of part of the A344 road has begun the process of healing scars in the landscape. Now, what I think we were all asked to do was um, set out, well, what more do we need for the future of, uh, uh, um, of Stonehenge? So ICOMOS UK would like to suggest six aspirations. The first is the formal acknowledgement of the integrity of the World Heritage Site as a landscape. We think it already is a cultural landscape, and we cannot, I have to say, see the point of renominating it. It is a landscape, but the integrity of it needs to be acknowledged very formally. That is the crucial interrelationship between individual monuments and also between the monuments and their buried archaeology. Secondly, we would like to see the overall World Heritage landscape given protection and for its setting beyond the boundaries. Currently, um, individual monuments are protected, not necessarily their spatial relationship. Thirdly, it has long been acknowledged that the boundaries of the World Heritage Site are not entirely lo logical. Um, and as has been already noted in the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value, there is reference to this. And I would like to say that the, the view of the World Heritage Committee um, was that once sites had a retrospective statement of OUV in place, and following on from that could identify the attributes which convey that value, then that was a very useful opportunity to look at the boundaries critically and see if you've got them right. And many, many sites around the world have undertaken what's been called a sort of boundary clarification process to look at whether their boundaries are as clear and as logical as they ought to be. And perhaps, well, we would suggest that would be very helpful for, for this site. I mean, we're not suggesting major, massive, extra boundaries, but a, a, a logical discussion of, of where the attributes lie. And then fourthly, we also believe that the, the immediate setting of the World Heritage Site likewise needs to be adequately defined and appropriately protected. Fifth, we consider the, the surveys and research that have been carried out so far, uh, are, are, um, the results that have come out from them have been stunning. But for, for a site that is so sensitive as uh, Stonehenge, and for a site which appears to have such research uh, potential, we consider that there should be a 20-year plan for further surveys and research, and to formalize a commitment to ongoing um, uh, research through the development of a research strategy for the site and its setting, based on acknowledgement of that, the potential of the landscape, and that it will, or it might, only be fully realized on the basis of yet as discovered techniques. And finally, number six, in order that understanding keeps pace with research, an interpretation strategy that facilitates understanding of and access to the wider world heritage landscape around the main monuments, uh, as we've heard earlier from the National Trust. Now, ICOMAS UK recognises that there are challenges that need to be addressed in the World Heritage Site, of which the AE303 is the largest and most complex, and one that has been on the agenda for decades. But the government's road programme does appear to offer the potential for a possible solution, although, as we've all heard, there's no outline or detailed tunnel scheme as yet on the table. We have concerns over what tunnel schemes might emerge, and particularly over the location of portals in relation to the World Heritage Site and to the overall archaeological landscape. However, we consider that if all those six aspirations that I've just outlined were to be put in place or committed to, 
they would form the essential evidence base necessary to ensure that a long-term and sustainable infrastructure strategy could be devised, within which discrete proposals for road improvement might be evaluated through heritage impact assessments against, against a very detailed knowledge of the Stonehenge archaeological landscape and its outstanding universal value. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heather Sabir from the English Heritage Trust, as we're now called. Uh, I'm the curator for Stonehenge, and I'll be advising on the archaeology uh, that affects English heritage. Um, so English Heritage became a charity on the 1st of April 2015, so this year, and now known as the English Heritage Trust, which cares for sites held in guardianship for the nation. We're licensed by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, represented by our former colleagues, now in a separate non-departmental public body known as Historic England, as Andrew's already alluded to. And our job is to conserve the guardianship sites and their collections for the benefit of this and future generations. And Stonehenge is one of the wonders of the world, I'm sure we would all agree, and the best known prehistoric monument, certainly in Europe, and is in our care. So we have the Stonehenge Environmental Improvements Project, and while the governance and funding structure of English Heritage has changed, our vision for Stonehenge and the World Heritage Site hasn't changed. We continue to sit on the Stonehenge World Heritage Site Committee, alongside the other organisations that have signed up to the sustainable protection of the World Heritage Site and to advise on the implementation of the management plan. We also continue our commitment to the monument, being reconnected to its authentic extended landscape, reducing the negative impact of roads and great strides have have already taken place to achieve this vision uh, over recent years. I'd just like to remind you that we have delivered the Stonehenge Environmental Improvements Project that has been a step change in the way Stonehenge is presented and how people experience it. The objectives of the project were to improve the landscape setting of Stonehenge by reducing noise and visual intrusion from inappropriate structures and roads, to significantly enhance the visitor experience through the provision of improved, environmentally sustainable visitor facilities, to enhance the interpretation of the World Heritage Site and improve access to selected monuments, and to enhance the education and learning experience and thereby improving the understanding of the World Heritage Site. The project, known as SEEP, was drawn up in partnership between English Heritage, the National Trust, the Highways Agency, Wiltshire Council, Natural England and the Government within the framework provided by the Stonehenge World Heritage Site Management Plan, uh, first in 2009 and now we have the new one written uh, and published this year in 2015. The project was largely funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, commercial income and philanthropic donations. It has involved the delivery of improvements to the landscape setting of Stonehenge, the monument itself, including the stopping up of the A344, the removal of the old visitor centre, car park and underpass, together with a new sensitively designed and environmentally sustainable visitor centre to provide a gateway to the stones and the wider World Heritage Site. Visitors now have the opportunity to engage with Stonehenge and the landscape through our state-of-the-art exhibition and external interpretation, while also being encouraged to explore particularly the north side of the World Heritage Site during their visit. We have restored a sense of dignity to the setting of one of the world's most loved ancient monuments. And we did get some archaeology along the way. Uh, we had um, various uh, mitigation uh, programs underway, but we also did manage to find the remnants of the avenue ditches when we stopped up the A344, so we have increased research just through the project as well. Alongside the Monument of Stonehenge itself, English Heritage Trust also has Woodhenge and part of Durrington Walls in guardianship, and the new interpretation at the visitor centre and in the immediate landscape shows the context of Stonehenge in a continuous ritual and economic landscape with exceptional survival of prehistoric features of many types. As with our partners Historic England and the National Trust, we are committed to pre presenting Stonehenge as part of this unique wider landscape, now clearly defined as having outstanding universal value as redefined by UNESCO in 2013. And through the Stonehenge Environmental Improvement Project and the World Heritage Site Management Committee, English Heritage now has a solid track record of partnership working to achieve a sometimes difficult or even impossible shared vision for the benefit of the World Heritage Site. So the A303 and the road investment strategy. English Heritage has always sought to find a solution to the proximity of the A303 to the monument of Stonehenge. 
Not only does this road compromise the setting of the monument and disconnect it from the south side of, of the A303, but we all know it's a dangerous road and has chronic traffic congestion, uh, both around Stonehenge and further down. And at Stonehenge, there are huge pressures on government, locally and nationally, to do something about it. So this means that something must be done. It is inevitable that a road scheme will be pushed through at some time. Our main area of responsibility is to conserve the monument while maintaining ease of access for our visitors and to provide an exemplary visitor experience at the site itself. The visitor experience is currently undoubtedly compromised by noise pollution from the road, visual intrusion, oral intrusion from the noise and light pollution from the glare of headlamps. While there isn't a scheme on the table, we are monitoring Highways England's progress and we would support Highways England's and the government's ambitions to reroute the A303 past Stonehenge in a tunnel of at least 2.9 kilometres. Our aim will be to influence a deliverable scheme which demonstrably protects the outstanding universal value of the World Heritage Site. We recognise the opportunities and benefits a tunnel scheme would bring, but we're equally <coughs> conscious of the risks of, to the OUV of the World Heritage Site and potentially to its designation should a damaging option such as surface duelling be the preferred improvement. English Heritage Trust would therefore require being a major stakeholder in consultations on any new road scheme. Other stakeholders will see that we have, as part of the SEAT project, already ensured that all the recent works have safeguarded and enhanced the significance of Stonehenge by restoring its immediate setting with regard to the closure of the A344, but also by taking account of the wider internationally important landscape of which the major guardianship monuments are components. The removal of the A303, which intrudes both visually and orally on the site, will ensure that Stonehenge is completely restored to its landscape and visitors will be able to appreciate the full extent of the World Heritage Site. So in summary, Stonehenge has recently been transformed and we hope to build on this work through partnership and the framework of the World Heritage Site Management Plan. We keenly await information from Highways England about the feasibility of the tunnel scheme and plan to actively participate in consul the consultation phase of the project. Alongside this, we are committed to working with our heritage partners to present a strong voice for improvement in accordance with the World Heritage Site Management Plan. And uh, rather than look at slides, we have brought our film with us just to finish off, which we hope uh, you will agree just summarises that all very nicely.
Thank you very much. Very interesting to, to see the filmmakers' art there. Um, we've heard a lot, and it, it is clear that there are some really interesting and intractable issues about how far we can go to continue to, to reunite. I suppose the extent to which I would take issue with that is that it's a job partly done. Yes. Um, and, uh, and how we can work in a way that is going to actually produce some deliverable results to, to get to what I am absolutely clear, having listened to all of our panelists, everybody is really in the long run looking for the, the same outcome, which is to return tranquility to that site uh, and really to, to think about the ways in which we can look at the whole of the landscape uh, now that so much work has been done. And, and I, as I say, I um, didn't go into the archaeology in huge detail, neither did anybody else because I wouldn't give them the chance. Um, Mike will this evening, uh, copies of Mike's new book will be uh, on sale out here in between this and the AGM. So I know we're the Council for British Archaeology and I know we should be talking about the archaeology, but later. Um, so thank you very much to all five of you. Uh, really interesting to hear a calm, clear exposition of where the issues lie and where the different weights are that we might give to those different issues. Um, and I'd like to uh, open uh, up to the floor now for questions. Um, so can I ask who would like to start? Marianne. Um, moving away from the road, because I think it would be wonderful if there isn't a road. Um, Given the fact that 90% of the, of the visitors actually haven't got a sense of the wider landscape, what are you proposing to do about making that much more accessible? Because, of course, once there is no road, people can go south, and there is a wealth of, of um, archaeology there. How, how do you propose that will be more accessible for people going forward? Will you do, I don't know, walks, guided tours, audio tours? I don't know. So I'll, I'll just repeat the question for the sake of the, of the little film. Um, it's really once the road is gone, on assuming that, that it goes, how do we interpret that wider landscape for people actually physically moving through it? Walks, audio tours, what, what might we do? Who would like to answer? Um, shall I start with Go that? on. Um, I, I think, I mean, simply put, the answer is probably all, all of the above. Uh, but um, National Trust was involved in another very, very um, successful um, landscape tunneling project at Delta Pentacle and Hindhead, where we took um, the, the road out of the landscape and put it in a tunnel. And we've seen the, the rebirth of that landscape and the use of it. Now, one of the things that taught us is actually we need to think upfront before anything comes anywhere near happening, before anything is even designed, in other words, now, to start thinking about how that landscape is going to be used in the, in the future. It's a really important question. And so a big part of our, um, of our internal project, a big part of the work that we're starting to do with our partners and using the management um, plan as our uh, guidance um, and the attributes of OUV as our sort of uh, you know, guiding stars really, is, is to think about the wider use of that landscape. Um, and the Trust has a real responsibility here because we, we have a great deal of it, um, to think about how we can make best use of our assets um, and what that would look like. So precisely what that looks, would look like, we don't know. We have to work through tenancy agreements and all sorts of things, but we know there's an opportunity there and we're very conscious of that and we're very conscious that we need to think very proactively upfront about that. Any other thoughts and comments? We've already done a little bit of this through the Stonehenge Environment Improvements Project in the bits of the landscape that are safe to walk around and I think we're all committed to certainly extending that. Yeah. I mean, kind of one just a little thing, which is just that when we took Ikemos and UNESCO around, what was so striking was that bit north of, of the, the road at Fargo, where people got off and decided to walk through the landscape rather than take the, the bus. The number of people who were out on a sunny October day, um, and it was, it was just wonderful to see that. And I know um, our international advisors were really pleased to see that, that connection and that active approach to engagement with the landscape. Thank you. Other, other questions? Yes. Um, yes, I just wonder, bearing in mind what uh, Susan Denyer said about exploring the context of the boundaries and defining and identifying all that, has much consideration been given to the possibility of great separated junctions at each end? So it's thinking about the boundaries, consideration given <coughs> to separated junctions? Well, you've got two major roundabouts at yeah. each end of the World Heritage Site. Yes. And I wonder what consideration has been given to the potential impact 
of how that's going to be managed. I realize it's a detail, no proposals on the table, but it's inevitable yeah. that those junctions are going to have to increase for volume, and the impact might be <coughs> so extraordinary. If we improve the road, what additional pressure is that putting on the junctions at Highbury End? And the landscape. And the landscape. I mean, as far as we understand it from uh, Highways England, that is one option to have very separated junctions. So um, I think it's fair to say if the end is then the way probably you want to go straight across like that's, uh, from the flat junction at the moment. Um, and obviously that's something to be part of the design of whatever comes forward for the Western End, Long Barrow or whatever. Somebody just clarify for me a great separated junction? So it is the moment of, it's, it's the A1 solution for us. It's the moment at which you get rid of the roundabouts and you create flyovers and underpasses. Hey, okay. what slide 15? I can try. Bear with me if you want to talk. This is a, an image I took from the drawings for the 2004 inquiry documentation for the previous scheme. Not this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's coming. <laughs> Number 15, I think it was. It's, this is a very complicated slide. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, it's rather dull. Um, what it does show you is um, what we would call a dumbbell arrangement at Long Barrow, here, the Long Barrow just tipping into the corner. And um, as I mentioned before, the green road that runs along towards the east is the present A3 or would have been the present A3 reduced to a byway. So you would in fact have three lanes close together. Um, I, in this case, it's an underpass and an overpass for the roundabouts. Um, somewhere or other along the A360, presumably that would happen again, even if it's taken further south. And at the other end, it was a simple um, overpass for the A303 with the present roundabout still in place. Enough room was left with the present roundabout at Countess to allow for a great separated junction. I'm, I'm not sure that the past is necessarily a guide to the future in this brave new world. I, I wonder if um, Dr. Nick Sachel, who is the National Trust archaeologist for the Stonehenge and Acre World Heritage Site, might have a bit more insight into this. Just a little bit. I think one of the things you say, um, actually, in the room is quite right, that the 2004 scheme isn't necessarily a guide to what might come forward. We don't have detailed proposals. And one of the things that we do know already is that even in outline, the scheme methodology must be different because the 2004 scheme, for instance, was not for a whole new world tunnel. Um, it, in it included an element um, at Stonehenge Bottom that would have come right through into the surface. So um, there would have been um, a Sorry. Is that a little bit better? Okay. Just speak more loudly. <laughs> um, so there was an element in the 2004 scheme, for instance, where at Stonehenge Bottom, where past King Barrow Ridge, um, there's the a big swoop down into the landscape where it would have cut through to the surface. So there are many details of design that may be different. Um, we don't yet know what exactly is going to be proposed for either end, east or west, under this new scheme. But what we hope will be the case um, is that following the 2.9 offline uh, proposal that you saw, the hyper hypothetical proposal that we assessed, that that roundabout um, and that road junction would be pulled much further south so that it would come a long way away from the Winterboard Stoke um, group of monuments. So it would much reduce the impact, um, both in terms of uh, the relationships between monuments being severed, the direct impact on the setting of that monument, and the tranquility of that group of monuments. So there's a lot of complexity still to be worked out, I think is the answer. But it may be that we can use information like this to dissuade the highways agency from yes. those sorts of boundaries. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, and that's the importance, I think, as Ingrid said, of having a, a constructive conservation approach of actually talking up front to people to try to persuade them before um, there are decisions made rather than waiting for a scheme to be proposed and then simply reacting to it. Can you do something about those horrible camper vans that are always parked along those byways? Is there anything that can be done about that? Can we do anything about the camper vans that screw the byways? Hello, I'm Connie McKellers, I'm Kate Davis, I'm actually the general manager of Stonehenge. The byways um, belong to Welch Council. They don't belong, who are a partner in the World Heritage Management Plan. Um, as part of the Stonehenge Environmental Improvement Project, we did try to get the byway closed and we were unsuccessful. 
Currently, there's no plan to try to get them closed again, but it is definitely something that is an acknowledged um, uh, problem with the landscape setting and it's still an aspiration for most of the partners that um, it goes along with the overall ethos of removing the visual intrusion and the noise and everything else of the infrastructure around Stonehenge. So, um, you know, we close it for and have special traffic regulation orders at certain times of the year, but at the moment we don't have the power to close it, but it's definitely an aspiration. Thanks. Uh, I do have a little debate, so can I ask the panel, is there consensus on what the preferred option for the A303 replacement is, and is there a cohesive strategy amongst the panel how to get there, including the walkers and the elimination of them? I suppose, I suppose thinking about it from the Chair's point of view, I think that there were divergences of opinion, is the answer, between whether we look for a deliverable solution or whether we say, we've held out once, we can hold out again to get an optimal solution which would be portals right outside the World Heritage Site. The issues there would be about the degree to, to which government would be prepared, I suppose, to, to underwrite that. And I right to hear that seems to me to be a, a yeah. pivot in this discussion. It's a bit of a difficult question to answer, but I, you know, I think my only comment is that to look back at the point at which the government made their announcement and the fact that there was consensus between National Trust and Historic England, we understand it was a key consideration. So all I would say is that consensus, and consensus among the wider historic environment sector, is clearly a key issue here. Okay, can I say something about that? Um, the reason why the previous 2.1 kilometre tunnel scheme failed was the problem with phosphatic chalk of which there is quite a deep band under the Stonehenge section of the A303. And um, it is full of flint, I understand, it's loose, it's not stable, and so it's very difficult to tunnel through. It can be done, but it's expensive. They decided to abandon the scheme because of the expense, and in addition to the geology, there were problems with the water table. In the 2.1 kilometre tunnel scheme, the tunnel would have reached the surface in, um, as a mound in Stonehenge Bottom, and in fact would have Blocked the, the, the water in flood or whatever, and it just wasn't practicable. So um, there are actually hydrogeological problems to be resolved, whatever happens here. So we don't really know what is going to be feasible. So even the 2.9 kilometre tunnel might be problematic, and um, we just have to wait and see. But from our perspective, we would like to think that there may be, if, if a better solution could be, uh, obtained for the World Heritage Site, then maybe the money could be found somewhere else. And, and, and there are ways of <laughs> raising money. And uh, um, I'm not probably shocked for <laughs> my friends for saying this, but there are things like the road views of charging and tolling and so on that are done elsewhere in the world, and I think possibly even in the UK. And there are on the continent tunnels 20 miles long, and I, I think we need to think a bit sort of larger than we are at the moment and, and try to look for something really, really good instead of something that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I see that um, my colleague from Campaign for Transport would like to say something. We, we heard a moment ago about how we couldn't take the designs um, in terms of great separated junctions as a given because there were no plans on for, for the actual alignment or, or design for the road as present. I'd actually like to step back from that and say you can't actually take the traffic levels as a given, as it seems a lot of the participants have. The government has a long record of overestimating um, traffic levels into the future. It's every time it is this huge great upward curve that's used to justify a new road. Well we've already heard how the traffic levels from 2002 haven't really changed till today and they're roughly at the same level. Yet according to the DFT projections we should be massively higher than we are already. Um, that is being started to take into account in future government projections, but it hasn't really made its way through. So the justification for this road, in traffic terms, is minimal. If you look at congestion problems on the A303, they're minimal on weekday commuter times compared to any other place in the, in the country, in terms of centre of, of cities, in terms of places like, like where, near where I live, on the A27. They are minimal. They are, they are worse at peak holiday times and sort of Friday nights, Sunday afternoons. But I think we need to see the, the problem in context because it's not black and white, just how those, those designs are black and white. Actually, the justification isn't completely solid either. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so there's contention over the traffic numbers as well. Um, if we, we know that, and it's always a very interesting question when you come to public inquiries, really to nail it. I'm sure we're not going to nail it in the room, but it's, it's a helpful thing to remember. And, and I, sorry, can I just add, and I, and I, I think we have to remember the current harm and the current impact of the A303 as it exists let alone the increase in harm if dueling is proposed or, or whatever else. You know, there, there is a win here as well that we ought to, to keep in mind. This, yeah. I just want to acknowledge that point about the traffic on a 303. Um, I think that it's worth seeing that in the context of all the local roads, not just the 303. I can't speak on behalf of the local community, but we know that rat running and volume of traffic on all the much smaller local roads is a significant issue. And the public opinion is, is a strong one that something has to be done about the 303 um, to make sure that the main roads are used, not the local country roads through people's villages. And so I don't think um, it, the, the um, feelings of the local community about finding a solution to the 303 can be ignored. It's a very, very powerful voice. And obviously, as, we, as you mentioned, Jane, when we started this discussion, there's lots of different people with lots of different drivers for why we need a solution. We're obviously people with a very heritage and archaeology focus, but there are local people who want uh, an easy access around their local villages. And so I think that needs to be considered in the context of this. It's not just about how busy it is on a Friday afternoon. And that's something that Kate noted the right running of villages initially. Right, let's move on. Okay. Yes, a different, uh, a different point now. I'm Pete Collins, Europe and Nostra. But also, I've argued this point for CPRE. Now, the tranquility issue in the long term, but it doesn't only come along the ground, there is the, and, and presumably now under the ground, but also in the air. I've spent uh, quite a good deal of time uh, discussing with NATS and proposing NATS in the way they are trying to take over all the airspace in the United Kingdom. Um, it is a diff difficult problem across Europe as the extent to which governments could protect the landscape against. It may be one matter to be of a certain height from sea level, another matter to be quite a different height uh, from an AOMB and from the area of the <coughs> What I don't know is under the designations given if there are promises by government to keep airspace completely clear within a certain range of a monument landscape. I don't think so, because I don't miss those sites which are terrible. Now, it seems to me that this might be a good test case in which it should be run to earth. If they can't keep tranquility on this landscape area, it would be a very bad thing. And surely this must be part of any plan going forward to make sure that over air, uh, within a certain distance of the monument and indeed the whole landscape area, must be built in. Uh, can we have um, views as to what's being done about that and how far we've got? Anybody in the room who can answer that? Do we do we protect the airspace? The airspace is certainly very controlled um, by the military, uh, although they do use it themselves. But uh, we have a lot of requests come in very frequently now for drone flying, um, which you don't allow it directly over the stones, but they have to have permissions from the CAA and from the, the military airspace as well. But we don't control it. It's, I don't know anyone else has any more information about that. We don't. They're not, as I understand it, and I can't quote, I'm sorry, but they, you know, they're not supposed to fly within any certain heights and, and certain proximity. I don't know how that's enshrined, whether it's an MOU or... But there is, there is some kind of protocol for that and the against the monuments. But you can do better, because I've visited Benson and discussed with the military people about how they fly their helicopters and everything else. There are fewer and fewer air airports which the military can use, and they have to use the ones that they have as best possible to protect us. But they're very, uh, Vincent is very flexible in trying to keep its flights in directions away from directly over people's houses, and indeed, in, in this case, this would be an important one for them to avoid. I'm sure they could be, uh, but, but I'm also thinking of the wider matter of Nats using the airspace for commercial flight. That should be completely outlawed within a certain distance. There are both of these, but I, I found the actual military people rather helpful in trying to do as little as possible. And perhaps through the World Heritage Site Management Plan, that's something we can continue to pursue in course. It would be a huge, a huge battle and a very big one. But I hope it will be automatically built into any discussion. Okay, so uh, Julian Richards at the back and Mike Pitts. Julian, did you want to comment on this? Yes, it was. Yes, it was just 
fact that obviously we've been controlled for the commercial flight, but the, the, you know, just as it's awkward to have the A303 running through the centre of the World Heritage Site, you've also got to be very honest the fact that you're sandwiched between Boscombe Down and Lark Hill, um, both of which are incredibly busy. And if we're talking about tranquility, I'm not convinced you're going to be able to persuade the uh, Royal Artillery to stop firing guns, um, which is quite disturbing, but it's, it's a, a part of that landscape that has been for the last century. So it's, it's not an easy solution, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Mine. Hello? Thank you. I'd like to just go back to the earlier discussion. Um, first, when we think of the things that have changed since the tile was last on the table, um, as well as the apparent huge amount of money that the government is now offering for roadworks, um, there is also a new determination in government to, to do something about the 303. It's not something we saw before, and this doesn't just concern the bit that goes through the World Heritage Site, but the whole route down to the southwest. And I think when we talk about the possibility of holding out something better, we need to remember something that wasn't really with us before, and that is that sooner rather than later, decisions will be taken about doing something to the A303, and among those options would be a simple open dual carriageway for the whole thing through the World Heritage Site. A couple of questions. One, and this comes from the presentations. The outstanding universal value, there seems to be some disagreement as to, to, to whether that is newly significant in the way the World Heritage Site is considered with regard to things like roadworks, or whether this has always been there. I wonder if we could have clarifi clarification on that. And the other thing was, I think it's an interesting point about what people will miss when they're driving down from the east from London, from Reading and so on, in not being able to see Stonehenge as they pass, and how that might affect the extent to which drivers coming from the east will consider stopping in the World Heritage Site rather than driving on, and whether, you know, how much that's been considered and what, how that looks. Thank you. Just a, a sort of word of clarification. Of course, Susan's quite right. It's there in 1972 in the original documentation. Um, but what's happened since is that there, is, there has been a, a, what might be characterised as a progressive clarification of not just what is meant by OUV, but how that should be used in the management of World Heritage Sites and how it's articulated, I think, for individual World Heritage Sites. So there were many World Heritage Sites, which, as Susan said, um, did not originally have um, statements of outstanding universal value, and therefore it has been back-engineered. What that has done in terms of the Stonehenge World Heritage Site, it means we now have additional clarity about what the outstanding universal value of the World Heritage Site is, both in terms of its generality in the statement of outstanding universal value, and uh, a more concise articulation of the, what are called the attributes of outstanding universal value. So that's essentially the things that make the World Heritage Site globally significant and express that significance. Within, physically within the, the monuments. So in some cases, it's the actual Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments, physically, it's the relationships between them, visually, it's their setting, it's their relationship with the landscape. There are a whole series of attributes. So it's a sort of progressive clarification. We now have much more clarification of that than we did previously. There's also, uh, in 2011, and referred to uh, earlier, uh, there's now uh, a set of guidance created by ICMOS International for carrying out heritage impact assessments in World Heritage Sites, which did not exist at the time of the previous published scheme. Um, and that sets out the ways in which one should approach heritage impact assessments and the use of um, uh, and understanding of the outstanding universal value of the World Heritage Site within the impact assessment. Okay, thank you. And Henry, oh, and John, Henry, if you could explain to people what your job title is. Uh, thank you, Jane. I'm Head of International Advice at uh, Historic England. And just to add to what Nick has been saying, if you go back to the original documentation from 1986, it is really rather beautifully simple uh, that there are 40 pages in total, including the ICMOS evaluation uh, of the nominations that we deal with today, and Susan McArthur in the other half of her life, uh, can fill the back of a van quite comfortably. But what I think we can be grateful uh, about is that in that original documentation, uh, the people putting that together were really quite far-sighted because the key elements that they identified about the integrity of the landscape, uh, the nature of the sort of prehistoric uh, architecture and monumentalism and so forth, 
uh, all really have stood the test of time. And the research that has been undertaken since, which, uh, as people have commented, is absolutely fantastic, is tended to add, add considerable depth, a considerable extra layering of information, but there's not been a great deal that has actually sort of fundamentally changed our understanding of the site. It's enhanced our understanding of the site, and we will continue to do so. And with the possible exception of the Mesolithic information from Lake Mead and other places, which uh, we can't really evaluate yet in terms of uh, significance in the overall context, and whether there is anything there that sort of might need some further consideration, that's a little bit further down the line. Where I think we can be confident is the depth of understanding we now have underpins the uh, retrofitted statement of outstanding universal value, and it therefore does provide a very good baseline for considering changes in the Stonehenge and the Avery landscape in the future. The attributes that Susan uh, mentioned, seven attributes, are defined in the management plan, and there is also a commitment in the management plan to review the boundaries in the light of that information. But uh, my suspicion would be that we'd be looking at minor boundary modification rather than a complete and fundamental change. Um, can I say that, first of all, that the CBA then established, then well established, its uh, principles about how to deal with Stonehenge. They were invaluable in drawing up evidence for the inquiry, and I strongly recommend that that approach... That yeah, sorry, been part of it. With the, we are doing this, yes. and this is part of that process. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, definitely. Totally applaud, when you're, on the, when you're on the witness stand, it matters. <laughs> um, can I also say that a couple of other things that have moved on since then are that ICOMOS has defined setting with its own declaration, and uh, Historical England has now got guidance, and a much better understanding altogether. And I was just looking at that last slide, um, a very good example there of where last time round, the topographical factors were simply not uh, put into the assessment of setting. Which slide? The Vince Gaffney one? The, the one that went to Bornstone Junction. 15. That, uh, that, that one. Yeah. yeah. So this is cutting a, a, a really serious gash through the ridge on which those barriers are setting, which are fundamental to, to why they're there. And it's a very simple, you can see by the profile. It's a massive scar. If you look at the little segmented ditch uh, just to the bottom left of the junction, it looks as though that's on the alignment of the barrier. So I think this is a kind of case where the setting of that barrier symmetry is going to have some archaeological impact, some archaeological factors as well. That would now be considered relevant, which it wasn't then. But I also want to draw back a bit because uh, part of the idea of those principles is that it sets up a framework within which the attributes of a successful scheme can be found. Now what we didn't take forward on that time round was enough to suggest or back any particular alternative. As it happens, what we recommended to the inquiry is what has happened. Right. And it was actually in the World Heritage Site Management Plan at the time, a staged approach. Uh, and that, because the cost of the tunnel more than doubled within two months at the end of the, the, the inspector issuing his report, uh, by default, uh, what has actually happened is the, the, the thing that only one organisation proposed, which was the CBA. And that was only really because we didn't feel we had enough to back any particular alternative. So what I would say is that if the 2.9 version of a tunnel or whatever is not going to meet those standards, then having something up your sleeve yeah. is important. The other thing I'd say is that the how is, how is England has still not really got on top of the sort of basic alternative design principles to take things forward on a level basis. This was a time of certainly big problem last time around. I think it still is that if you've got one billion pounds worth of a tunnel to throw at this problem, then a lot of routes which have been chucked out uh, way back, with that amount of mitigation or even less, could be a very serious contender. And I would say that it is definitely worth having another look at throwing that amount of money at some alternatives which might be outside the World Heritage Site. And I'd also back up what Mike said about how important it is that this is seen in the context of what happens either side. Because the Winterbourne um, State Bypass to consider other traffic flows and so on. So seeing it in a whole, not just within the microcosm of the World Heritage Site, is also, I think, very important. Um, but I do, and finally, uh, I'm currently a member of the Cotswolds AMB Conservation Board, 
And there's a similar, though not as, as large a problem, with the A417 at Birdhip, which is next to Crypto Hill. And the board has proposed uh, to the Highways England three principles on which uh, a route should be found. They're going back to square one, looking at, at routes, and we're now beginning to work out some environmental design aims. And again, I would recommend actually getting into it. Highways, environmental design objectives uh, of what's needed. Okay, well, thank you, George. Um, with those helpful remarks, I think I'm, I'm going to bring this to a close to make sure that we have a, an orderly turnaround. But I can reassure you that the principles are under consideration to see in what degree they need to be tweaked or not. Um, and once we've done that, then we can begin to look at, at schemes as they come forward. Uh, and I think to the extent that some uh, of the organisations on the panel are able to get to that upstream <coughs> negotiations, I think a lot of your points are actually already being taken. Just a very quick point, Jane. Um, in taking it forward, I mean, first of all, Department of Transport are wanting to produce exemplar schemes. You know, and there is a bit of a change of thinking there, I think. And Highways England are in implementing the scheme are uh, moving it forward, they're moving into what's called the information gathering stage, and we really want, we're so conscious of, of you know, a lot of things that you've expressed in trying to get a really good scheme, this isn't just standard engineering, so you know, we want to use this next phase as, as you know, the, the time at which we were achieving. If it was a major building, there'd be an architectural competition. Yes, well let's hope we're not... We're not meant to do that engineering competition. And part of, part of the DCO process is the need to go through that form of option proposal as well. So some of the stuff you suggested there is part of this information so, gathering stage. So we're hoping that these are not the only options. No, these are not. This is no, no, not the one. And with that, I really am going to bring it to a halt. So thank you all very much indeed. That's been a really helpful conversation. We thought about a lot of the traffic issues and the way in which they are looked at, and, and we have heard the voice that says you can look at this differently. We've thought about um, what the whole landscape problems are and we've thought about ways in which as a sector we must move forward. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.